today about the potential role of coarse mode particles in winter air pollution. And I want to stress that this is um, primarily the work of Amy Herdera from the University of Toronto that she completed in the process of getting her PhD. She is now Dr. Amy. Um, and this picture here um, is from a recent article in Science about a year and a half ago, which really discussed the role of wintertime air pollution and um, focused here on Salt Lake City. In fact, this picture was on the cover of that article. I encourage you all, if you haven't seen it, it's very well done. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about what is the role of coarse mode particles in this process. And excuse me, I want, there it goes. So um, as you all know, wintertime pollution events happen nearly every year in Salt Lake City, where an average of about 60% of that fine particulate matter is made of ammonium nitrate. And here is your PM 2.5 speciation has been discussed in the last couple call or last couple talks. We have a primarily ammonium nitrate during these wintertime events, with about 20% of that being organic carbon, and a smaller percentage, as Chris mentioned, of dust. Um, in general, our um, events reach between about 60 and 80 micrograms per meter cubed. And it's with understanding the chemistry, some specific science questions uh, that were asked that um, the winter fine particulate study was established in 2017. And this study was a combination of ground-based sites as well as flights using a NOAA twin otter. And I hope you all were able to visit Chris Rapp's poster where he overviewed data from the ground-based sites in the last session. And the primary, the prim primary um, objective of that winter fuel campaign was to understand the secondary formation of PM 2.5, as this is not a straightforward process. The real questions that were asked is the importance of relative humidity and temperature on this process. What is the limiting reagent of PM 2.5 in this formation process? So on the left side, you see um, your um, NO gas being produced, and that has to be converted to nitric acid. And there are different mechanisms to convert that. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but we have um, here shown in the orange are the photochemical mechanisms that allow for that nitric acid production. And here shown in the black are the nighttime processes that allow for that nitric acid formation. So once you have the nitric acid, does it form um, ammonium nitrate or is it deposited out of the environment? And that, uh, the atmosphere, excuse me. And that is what the question that we're going to be addressing here today. So what are the key sources of ammonium in the uh, Salt Lake Valley? That was another big question asked by the winter fine particulate um, matter study. And then finally, what is the role of snow in this study, in the role of snow in this process? And in order to address these questions, the um, University of Toronto brought to Utah a ambient ion monitoring system, which was coupled to an ion chromatograph. And the way this system works, it allows for you to look both at the gas phase and particulate phase chemistry simultaneously. So it had a one hour uh, sampling time where you could look at water soluble species and the detection limit of this instrumentation was well below atmospheric concentration. Um, in this scenario, there was a size selector and impactor put on the instrument of a PM 2.5 and you can see some of these highlights in the yellow are the measurements that I'll be speaking about most, the ammonium in particular. So as an overview for the winter fine particulate study, there was a super site, I would call it, at the University of Utah on the rooftop of the William Browning building. And then you additionally had a twin otter flying with chemical measurements both in the gas phase and in the particulate phase, including an aerosol mass spectrometer. And this is an example of a flight pattern during that study showing you the range of altitudes that was covered across the valley. 
So during the study in 2017, there were two um, PCASP events that we'll be focusing on here. And these were the primary two events for that year. And what's shown here is on the uh, bottom axis is time in Mountain Standard Time. And you're looking at January the 23rd through February the 20th. And you're looking at PM 2.5 in micrograms per meter cubed as it was measured by a TOM, as well as particulate ammonia and gas phase ammonia. Particulate ammonia and gas phase ammonia. And you can see here um, the units for that. And um, I put a square around the pollution events, which are going to be discussed throughout this process. And I want to give some credit to Ryan, who actually made these TOM measurements of PM 2.5 on the William Browning building. And then Amy was making the measurements of gas phase and particulate phase chemistry. So here's the slide that really is your larger take home message. So you're looking at your total, um, your total ammonia, excuse me, your total, um, your total nitrate versus your reduced inorganic nitrogen. And the key here is this is a one-to-one -one line. So in general, this uh, graph represents many instrumentations. So at the University of Utah site, you're looking in particular at the instrument that I mentioned before, the AIM um, ion chromatograph. From the aircraft, instruments were combined, including uh, aerosol mass spectrometer, as well as other instruments for the gas phase. And this allows you to really look at that combination of what is the total nitrate versus the reduced inorganic nitrogen and to understand the cycling between the two. And what pops out very quickly here is that the atmosphere looks very different from the snow. And I circled the snow in red here. So the atmosphere falls a bit below the one-to-one -one line, suggesting again that there is a uh, excess of the reduced inorganic nitrogen but the snow falls significantly above the one-to-one -one line. In fact, this maximum point is nearly three times the one-to-one -one line. So in general, there's about twice as much um, uh, nitrate in the snow as expected, but at times even three times as much. So the first take home message that I want you to walk away from is that when you're comparing the total nitrate and the total inorganic uh, nitrogen, you see that the inorganic nitrogen was in an excess during both pollution events. However, the chemical composition analysis of the snowpack revealed that the total comp concentration of the deposited um, nitrate was nearly three times greater than the deposited inorganic nitrogen. So why is the question to ask? Amy did a great job and took a lot of snow samples and these were all taken at the William Browning building again. And with those snow samples, she saw a very strong correlation between the amount of nitrate and the amount of calcium in the uh, snow. Well, why does that matter? Well, the reason that matters is because that indicates that there is a relationship between dust and nitrate found in the snow samples. The next thing that she found is that both sodium and calcium were found in the snowpack in a higher abundance than the inorganic nitrogen, despite it being present at much, much lower levels in the PM 2.5. So that's suggesting that these, um, these may be found, and we'll go further with that, in the coarse mode particles. So the first question that this begs is, are we accounting for all of the nitrate within this chemical process? Or potentially, are we losing nitrate? And we suggest a mechanism here, is that we're losing nitrate because there could potentially be much more nitrate depositing on mineral dust and sea salt. And this is an example of that. So now in our process, we're looking at our uh, ammonium nitrate, but the question we're asking, is are we losing quite a bit of that ammonium nitrate that was suggested by those snow samples to either a calcium carbonate process 
in which the calcium carbonate uptakes that ammonium nitrate to become calcium nitrate, or through a sodium chloride process in which, again, the sodium chloride uptakes that, um, uptakes that ammonium, excuse me, uptakes that uh, nitric acid to become sodium nitrate. So this is the question. In order to investigate that question further, here is where the research of my group came in, where um, the University of Toronto was making the chemical measurements of the aerosols. Our group was making the physical measurements of the aerosols. And in particular, we were able to address the question of what does the coarse mode aerosol look like? What does the PM 2.5 that is, what is the um, particulate matter that's greater than PM 2.5 look like? And this is a plot of that. So on the top graph, you're looking at the total fine mode surface area. On the next graph, you're looking at the total coarse mode surface area. And then finally, you're um, looking at a contour plot, which is showing you the uh, mass relationship for these particles. In particular, the um, particle diameter is shown here versus time. And the colors that are coming out at you are showing you concentration. And what I want you to focus on is this line, this PM 2.5 line. And above that line, we do see these episodes of coarse mode particles. And those episodes of coarse mode particles are what we'll be focusing on from this point forward. But for your second take home message here is that what we found is that the total surface area of fine mode is, as Chris mentioned during the comments earlier, uh, has a much greater surface area than the coarse fraction, but has less diurnal variability in 2017. However, even though there isn't that much coarse mode in the atmosphere, it has a extreme relative importance. And that's what I really want everyone to take home. The uh, fine mode aerosol nitrate is assumed to be in equilibrium with the gas phase. In contrast to the a coarse mode surface uptake, which could be reviewed, viewed as a uh, reactive sink, allowing for the net uptake. So in other words, the nitric acid is assumed to be in equilibrium in the gas phase. But if you add those uh, coarse mode particles, those coarse mode particles can quickly sweep up that nitric acid and could potentially act as a, as a um, significant deposition mechanism. So the main word I want you to hear here is that we're looking at coarse mode as a potential for an important permanent sink of that, of that nitric acid. So are the coarse mode particles regulating the PM2.4 formation of, by limiting that nitric acid? And what I'm asking here is, is there a reason that we're staying at a particular level of approximately 60 to 80 micrograms per meter cubed because of the coarse mode regulating that. So in order to address that, what Amy looked at is a pseudo first order removal rate. And that's shown here by K. So C represents your average molecular speed uh, for, and then you're looking at your uptake coefficient of your chemical composition. So we have two different scenarios here. The first scenario on the top of this circle here is showing you the scenario of a dust particle. The bottom scenario here is looking at the scenario of a salt particle. Okay, so we're looking at how does the nitric acid uptake onto either dust or salt. And again, this is a permanent uptake. So we're looking at a chemical transformation that permanently uptakes that nitric acid. What's important here is what's in the box which is your surface area of coarse mode particles. So is there enough coarse mode particles to actually allow for the time for this uptake to happen? And here is a plot from a paper that I'll, I'll point to that's currently under review from 2020. And what you're looking at here is the time that it takes for these different scenarios. So the pink is the dust scenario, and this is your uptake coefficient for dust. And in the, um, Gray is your uptake coefficient for salt. And both of these uptake coefficients assume a relative humidity of approximately 50%. On the graph here, you're looking at the time in which this 
is a relevant scale. And we're seeing times between approximately one and 20 minutes, which feels, uh, which indicates that this is a reasonable time scale for this uptake to be important in terms of air quality for, um, for this scenario. Okay, so we still though need to do more in order to answer the question of our coarse mode particles regulating PM 2.5 formation by limiting that nitric acid uptake. And I will say that um, this has been done significantly by the University of Toronto group, by Amy. And um, I knew that I would not have enough time to discuss this in full detail. So I would encourage you to look at the chemical um, modeling effort that was done by, uh, by them in this paper. And this paper is currently uh, pre-print. Uh, the discussion has, is ongoing and the first final set of reviews has been put in and the reviews were, were pretty gentle. So I have no doubt it will be published relatively soon. So in order to go further with this uh, question, what we really need is more measurements. And in particular, we strongly suggest time resolved coarse aerosol chemistry composition measurements done in the winter time in addition to PM 2.5 composition to better quantify how much the coarse mode could potentially be limiting this nitric acid. To show you some kind of more recent results from this winter, as many of you um, experienced, we had a pretty uh, good air quality winter. We didn't have very many inversion events. And with that, we only really had one uh, event that we could explore this winter. And that event was from approximately November uh, 26 to December 8th of 2019. And what we saw was during this immersion event, again, we did see evidence of coarse mode particles that were occurring again on a diurnal pattern, suggesting that uh, this scenario that we saw in 2017 is not uh, you, solely unique, since that was our only measurement. Okay, um, in order to address this question and several others, I wanted to mention a follow-up field campaign that we have planned um, for winter 22-23. And this is a combination of two uh, proposed field campaigns, one being proposed to NOAA and NSF, and the second one being proposed to uh, DOE. So the first campaign is called Aquarius, and that's air quality research in the Western United States. And the second field campaign being proposed is called ARIES, which is aerosol radiation interaction studies. Both of these um, pre-proposals have been submitted and um, encouraged at this point. And so final proposals are due relatively soon. We have um, a team of, of 45 authors that have been working on a BAMS paper and the first draft of that BAMS paper is completed. So we're working towards getting that submitted this summer also. These, this proposed field campaign will um, again explore in the winter of 22 and 23 and will focus on two uh, basin areas within the western United States. First, the three populated valleys within Utah, Salt Lake City, uh, Utah Valley, and Cache Valley. And then we'll also be exploring the San Joaquin Valley in California. And the primary reason for um, implementing these two valleys is that we have two primary different scenarios. One where you have a ammonium nitrate dominated uh, aerosol load in Utah compared to a secondary organic aerosol dominated load in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, the University of Utah did host a workshop in September of 2019, and that was um, with funding from NOAA and NSF. And we had 120 attendees with about 50 institutions represented in five countries, and many people on this line were at that workshop, and for that, I greatly appreciate it. I wanted to acknowledge the um, Aquarius Aries Organizing Committee, um, from the University of Utah, it's myself, Logan Mitchell, and John Lynn, um, Eric Crossman, now at Texas A&M University, De uh, Steve Brown at NOAA, Chris Kappa at UC Davis, Jen Murphy at University of Toronto, and then uh, Kelly Barsani at UC Riverside. This is the, uh, the uh, figure just showing the uh, reasoning for this measurement campaign. Of course, as we're all familiar, 
We're often in exceedance in Salt Lake City. You see a very similar scenario in Bakersfield, but yet in Riverside, decreasing in PM 2.5 in the winter has been observed. So understanding the reasonings for that transition. And then finally, here's an acknowledgement slide acknowledging uh, the team at the University of Toronto that worked on this proposal, or excuse me, on this paper, as well as the team at the University of Utah that worked on the um, winter fine particulate study and hosted Amy during her visit, and then the Utah Department of Air Quality.